The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord is in the tenth year of King Zedekiah of Judah, which is the eighteenth year of Nebuchadnezzar. At that time, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem, and the prophet Jeremiah was confined in the court of the guard that was in the palace of the king of Judah, where King Je Jedeziah, Zedekiah of Judah had confined him. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Hananel, son of your uncle Shalom, is going to come to say to you and say, Buy my field that is in the and the top for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. Then my cousin Hanamel came to me in the court of the guard in accordance with the word of the Lord and said to me, Buy that field that is in Anathoth, the land of Benjamin, for the right of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. Then I knew that this would be the word of the Lord. And I bought the field of Anathoth for my cousin Hanamel and weighed out the silver to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the silver on scales. Then I took the sealed deed to purchase containing the terms and conditions in the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of Messiah, in the presence of my cousin Animal, in the presence of the witness who signed the deed of purchase, and in the presence of all Judeans who were sitting in the court of the guard. In their presence, I charged Baruch, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, take these deeds, both this sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, and put them in the earthenware jar, in order that they may last for a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the Lord of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is uh, 1 Timothy verse. Chapter 6, verses 6 through 19, which is on page 965 in the Bible. <clears throat> of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, men of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, of the faith. Take a hold of the eternal life to which you were called, and for which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which will bring about at the right time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of the kings and Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be the body, or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, a storing of themselves and the treasure of good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of life that, life that really is life. This also is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Sister.
also God's word as it comes to us in Luke's gospel, the 16th chapter, and in it, Jesus shares yet another story about our use of wealth. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple with fine and wore fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. And the rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the, tongue of his, the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like, in like manner received evil things. But now Lazarus is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. And the man said, then, then, Father, I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that Lazarus may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. And Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Friends, this also is the word of the Lord that is speaking to God. <clears throat> the great subrat used to be required reading for many students, and I do not know if John Steinbeck is still included in the literary canon for our students. But there are more recent works that describe the suffering caused by the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. Boys in the Boat by Daniel James Brown and the Four Winds by Kristen Hanna also remind us of the dire straits in which people find themselves through no fault of their own. A global economic meltdown a hundred years ago destroyed lives. Environmental cataclysm pushed millions of people out of the homes and states in which they lived. American migrants depended on the kindness of strangers. And as it was for Blanche Dubois in The Streetcar Named Desire, that meant their downward spiral could not get much worse. Experiences of agony or comfort are exacerbated or assuaged by the hard-heartedness or compassion of others. Some of us are the arbiters of how others fare. Others of us rely upon the largesse of the ones making such decisions. Beware of how quickly the tables may turn. Jesus reminds us that the circumstances in which we find ourselves may change. Jesus encourages us to extend compassion if we ourselves ever wish to receive gestures of kindness. Respond to the agony of those who are near. Someday, 
we may be the ones in need. In Jesus' parable, we are told of a rich man who refused to have anything to do with Lazarus, a poor man who was at his gate. And the rich man avoided Lazarus even though he was suffering and he needed help. The rich man basked in his good fortune and would not be bothered with any who were not similarly blessed. The rich man went through life avoiding the poor man. And then he died. And then the poor man died too. And with the death of these men came a reversal of fortunes. We are told that the poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man died and also was buried. One ascended and one descended. Immediately following their deaths, the two men were treated differently. The rich man was buried. Just as it takes money to be buried today, so it was the case in the days of Jesus. The rich man could afford to be buried, and so he was. But after the rich man was buried in fine fashion, he found himself in Hades, death's abode. And the poor man was not buried. Jesus said that he died and was carried away by the angels. No burial for Lazarus, but no tragedy either. For angels came to carry him to the bosom of Abraham. And that was known as a place of honor, rest, bliss in the afterlife. The poor man was in bliss. The rich man was in torment. The two men had changed places from their earthly status. Now imagine how the rich man must have felt when he raised his eyes and saw away far in the distance Abraham with Lazarus by his side. Remember that Abraham was the father of all the Hebrews. And the rich man was Jewish, as was Lazarus. And the rich man did not want Abraham to forget that he was part of the family. He wanted to be joined with Abraham so that he could continue to experience the good life. He called out to Abraham and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. The rich man was a gutsy guy. He had shown no mercy in his own life. He who had refused to extend any kindness to Lazarus in his time of need now had the nerve to ask for mercy. And he asked for Lazarus to be the one to offer him assistance. The rich man said to Abraham, send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water that he might cool my tongue. For I am in great pain in these flames. On earth and in Hades, the rich man desired to have all his needs met. And notice how his tongue was hot. That which had once experienced pleasure through feasting now experienced pain by burning. If only his tongue could receive a little relief, just even a drop of water. And Abraham acknowledged that he recognized the rich man, acknowledged he was part of his kin, and he responded to the rich man with clarity and assuredness. Remember, my child, that you received your blessings during your life, while Lazarus only had misfortunes. Now he is comforted here, and you are in great pain. The man of great privilege has already experienced his pleasure, and now it is Lazarus' turn. And having found himself condemned to Hades, the rich man pleaded that his family be spared his fate. Crying out to Father Abraham, the rich man said, 
I beg you to send Lazarus to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Now, if this portion of the parable sounds familiar, it's because it is. We revisit it every Christmas if we happen to catch another uh, production of A Christmas Carol. In all likelihood, Charles Dickens took the idea for his story from this. The rich man who is dead wants to warn his brothers to change their ways. In Dickens' novel, the request is honored. Joseph Marley visits Ebenezer Scrooge to announce that have, Scrooge will have three visitors descend upon him. And sure enough, the ghosts of Christmas present, past, and future review with Scrooge the events of his life and the consequences of his choices. Scrooge then experiences a radical transformation, a change of heart. He repents. He turns away from his lifestyle in which he had hoarded his possessions, and he turns instead to the task of improving the circumstances of Tiny Tim and the orphans of his city. Charles Dickens crafts his script to result in the redemption of Ebenezer Scrooge. Scrooge receives a dead visit from the dead and repents. Not so in the story told by Jesus. Father Abraham tells the rich man that his loved ones will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. And the irony, of course, is that Christ is raised from the dead. Christ comes to us to align our lives with God's will. The living Christ is our divine emissary, both human and divine, and he tries to direct our paths away from Hades and toward heaven. We have people in our lives who are like Lazarus. They are at our door, desperate for a compassionate response from us. And Jesus devoted his life to bring comfort to those who are in pain. And Christ invites us to follow and do the same. Amen. And so let us sing of the intersection of our lives in number 408, where across the crowded ways of life. <laughs>
let us pray. We look to you, Lord, for all that is needful and good for our lives and for our service of you. You open your hand and we rejoice in the fullness that pours forth. Open yourself to us now that we might open ourselves to you in prayer. We pray for those in need of better health. We pray for Judy, that her surgeon be deft and her mending go quickly. We pray also, O oh God, for the disparity among us, for the rich and the poor. You see the great and widening chasm that grows between some of us who have so much and those who are desperately poor. Grant, O oh Lord, that we would readily share the resources at hand as readily as those who are in need would be relieved of their suffering. Renew your people in being prophets of justice. We pray also, O oh God, for those whose hopes are slim but who refuse to give in to their desperate conditions. Deliver those everywhere whose lives have been lived surrounded by violence and destruction, whether in Ukraine, Palestine, Mexico, Haiti, Ethiopia, Congo, in all those places where brutality threatens to outlast hopes for peace. Give strength to all who continue to bear witness to the righteousness and justice that are foundations for lasting peace. We trust that by your Holy Spirit we have opened ourselves to you in our prayers, as you have graciously opened yourself to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Let us continue our service by singing hymn number 427.